we've mentioned many times in the past that the value of a mitzvah, it's not that God wants you to do his will and take initiative to put on tefillin, to eat matzah, to eat kosher, to observe Shabbos or, or the Yom Tif, the festival, take the four species to sit in the sukkah. God just wants you to do it. And if you do it, you'll, he'll, you'll be rewarded and he's happy that you did it. Because you, you listened to his dictate. And negative commandment, because God doesn't want you to do certain things. Because he, he doesn't like you should do that. Let's say we. A child misbehaves. Why is the parent upset? Because the child, he, the parent wants the child to behave in a certain way. See, the child, the parent has a certain degree of expectation of the child. And therefore, the child doesn't behave that way. The, ch- the parent disciplines the child. But why does the parent want the child to behave in a certain way? To develop certain habits, positive habits. Modes of behavior. Because for the future of that child's life, when it comes to an adult, once it becomes routine, habitual, it's not something you have to make a choice. It, it comes natural. A child initially as a child is never reined in and disciplined to behave and act a certain way. As an adult, the child has no focus because everything in life, will, then it becomes an effort. You have to rein in on yourself. But if a person naturally is disciplined to take control of himself in a certain setting, it comes natural. You don't have to expend your energy to act appropriately or to act responsibly. But if a person was never taught to act appropriately or responsibly, because the person was never disciplined, this person has a tough, tough road ahead of himself. Because everything in life now becomes very complicated. It becomes overwhelming, effort-wise. But with Hashem giving us mitzvahs, positive every commandment, it's much more than that. Not much more than that. A person has a certain deficiency. A person is a diabetic. And he has to take insulin every day. Unless he has that infusion of insulin, his body doesn't function well. He can't process certain foods. And the foods, which normally could be beneficial, will be detrimental to that person. He needs that infusion. He needs the infusion that the physical system should work well. A person needs certain medication so the irregular heartbeat should not damage the heart. So the infusion is that the heart should function properly. A person needs certain anxiety medication so there should be a certain calmness in the body because when the anxiety takes over there are all kinds of chemical secretions which are given out and the body can't function right so there that has to do with the function of the body a person is given a soul our existence is not to exist for our physicality if it was to exist for our physicality We could have been created like the animal. We're an intellectual animal. We have a high degree of intellect. We'll even surpass the porpoises. Got it? So the Navy won't use you as, as, you know, to to, to figure out radar. Sonar radar. You don't need it. So why did God give us a soul? To maximize on our physical existence? You know, there's a Mishnah. The last mission in Kedushin speaks about have you ever seen a bear who's involved in being a porter as a livelihood? Bear has tremendous strength. You see a picture of a, of a grizzly bear, a polar bear. They have tremendous strength. They could carry anything on their backs. A lion has tremendous strength. A deer has swiftness. Are they concerned about their livelihood? They don't be concerned about the livelihood. Why? Because God provides everything naturally that they exist in their habitat, 
and God provides whatever they need. But the human being, also, if God provides for them, you don't think God provides for you? Especially if you're an intellectual animal. What's the value of upgrading your intellect? You ever hear an animal being depressed? Not sure, you know, you got to speak to the veterinarian. No? But a human being gets depressed. Because there's expectations. There's ego. And if the ego can't be satisfied, the person goes into, in, takes a nosedive. You realize, the man who's number 15 on in Forbes, I walked down the street on Shabbat, and he didn't say, good Sabbath to me. Or then say good morning. The guy goes into the doghouse. Why? Because you know what it means not to be acknowledged by this man with that kind of wealth? Elon Musk, he saw me, he didn't even notice me. As I always say, therefore what? What, what did you miss out on? You can't tell the world that Elon Musk said good morning to you. What is it? What's it worth? It's all ego. It's all nonsense. So why did God give us a soul? To get caught up in this nonsense? To be controlled by our ego? It would have been easy to live instinctively, like, like an animal, like any living creature. What dictates their existence? Instinct. But what does God have to give free choice to the human being? Do I buy a Brioni or do I buy a Armani suit? Do I shop here and I shop there? Do I go to this restaurant to eat this kind of food? Do I go on the diet, a keto diet, or do I do something else? That's, that's what free choice is about. You got it? God endowed the human being with a free choice. Do I take this kind of, do I go this profession or that profession? Is that what, why God endowed a human being with free choice? And what about before there were all these professions? Where everybody lived in a monarchy and you were a subject and all you were were a pawn on the board. What's the value of free choice? What's the value? To be treated like a slave. Do you listen to the master? Don't you listen to the master? I think the dog, it listens to its master. It does not be beaten to listen to its master. Naturally, it's dedicated. The dog is man's best friend, right? That's what they say. So why, why did Hashem give us a soul? The soul is not related to the physical existence. The soul has relevance to something outside of this existence. So what's life all about? Life is challenges. It's challenges based on God's dictates do you succumb to the physical and you ignore the spiritual and live like the animal, which naturally, instinctively, inclination was you are that? Or do you override that and take control and negate that and give value to the soul? When you do that, what are you doing? You're perfecting your soul. You're advancing your soul. How, how is that? How do you prevent it? How do you perfect it? So, based on the Midrash, based on Kabbalistic works, based on the Ramchal, based on the Maral, they explain this. As I said, a human being has 248 parts to his body. The 248 positive commandments. The 248 components to the Jewish soul. Just as every part of the body needs nourishment, and if the nourishment is cut off from that part of the body, that organ or that limb dies, unless it has a continuous flow of, of blood which nourishes it, the soul, the components of the soul have to be nourished. What's the nourishment of the soul? The nourishment of the soul is called mitzvah. Every mitzvah we do, whether it's Kriya Shema, whether it's Tefillin, whether it's observance of Shabbos, whether it's the observance of Yom Tif, whether it's the four species we take on Sukkot, whether it's the Matzah, the Seder, whatever it is, each one corresponds to that component. And the component of the soul that has to be nourished and advanced and spiritualized, doing that mitzvah 
provides that spiritual sustenance for that part of the soul, for that component. I mentioned now what Chaim Vital says, who was the student of Darizal, who recorded all his writings, all his teachings. But how do we know that? How do we know that? You know how we know it? Because when Hashem gave the Torah at Sinai, he says, you people have a soul. Your soul has 248 components. I, who created your soul, only I know exactly how to sustain and nourish each component in their soul to advance it, that it should become part of eternity. The study of Torah. That is the all-encompassing. Talmud Torah connected to Kulam. The tefillin corresponds to another part of the soul. Maybe it has corresponds to the arm, to the heart, to the brain. When you eat kosher, you eat the Paschal lamb, which is a part of the commandment. When you circumcise yourself, circumcision is on the body. Circumcision, we remove the foreskin, which is an expression of the tree of knowledge, the evil of the tree of knowledge, which Adam shouldn't have eaten. But there's a corresponding factor in the soul that has to be addressed because they have deficiency, which came about due to the eating of the tree of knowledge, which is evil. So the positives to advance us, that's nourishment for the soul. The Chavetz Chaim writes, we read in Pekei Avos, that there's no reward for mitzvah in this world. The mitzvah innately has so much value if you live the thousand years and you would encapsulate all the pleasures in one moment, it doesn't come to a moment of the world to come. It's something which is not, not comprehensible, it's not fathomable. He says, why? Why does the mitzvah have to give that kind of value that there's not enough within the finite existence to provide reward for that mitzvah? So the Chavetz Chaim says, you know why? If a person has to take a journey and the journey is forever, how much fuel do you have to take on that, on that, on that journey? He says, a person eats healthy as a human being and you nourish and eat to your, to, to your fullest. Are you set for life? A day passes, two days pass, three days. You have to re-nourish the body. What happened to the original nourishment? Whatever nourishment you provided is expended by the body and has to be replaced. The soul lives eternally. What maintains the, the functionality and the vitality of that soul? You have to fuel it with a fuel which is eternal fuel. Because if the soul is eternal, it has to exist eternally and it has to be worthy to exist eternally. So what, what's the infusion? The infusion is called the energy which is, which is provided by the mitzvah. That energy is energy which is not finite energy. That energy touches the infinite because the soul lives eternally which, is, which is, has relevance to the infinite. Therefore, therefore the, the result of doing a mitzvah, you cannot be rewarded in this world for that reason. That's the Chavetz Chaim. Could you imagine? You say to a person, you come, you study for five minutes, I'll give you $100,000. You know, they have all these incentives, these college programs, these outreach programs that they have programs, if you come to for Hillel or what, for two hours a week, you get pizza, and they even give you maybe a stipend. You know, and the, and the Jewish kids come, why not, for pizza, and not only, you may even get a trip to Israel on birthright. Free visit to Israel, who's not going to take it? You call up another kid, says, forget about the birthright, forget the pizza, forget the stipend. You come, study five minutes, I give you half a million dollars. You will have one Jewish kid in this world turning it down. Half a million dollars for five minutes? You want to know something? When you study Torah for five minutes, in terms of its innate value, it has more value than this whole world, in the whole physical world combined. In reality, that is the reality. How's it possible? 
You know why? Because God writes the check. And he says the check for that doesn't exist in this world. This world is too limited to be rewarded for that. So if a person is able to internalize that reality, where are you going to put your eggs? In which basket? In God's basket or in Farmer Joe's basket? Seriously. Although we relate to this because it's so abstract, but in terms of belief, we believe it, if, if you do believe it. And that's why Scarba Elm and Lekko. The mitzvah is so mega that there's not enough reward in this world that could, would be sufficient to provide for one mitzvah. But why, as I explained? The soul is spiritual. The soul needs sustenance. Who chose the sustenance? Who's the nutritionist? Who's the dietitian? You know who that was? That's God himself. God understands the makeup of the soul, the spiritual, and how to provide, how to nourish it. And that's the gamut of positive commandments. Each commandment provides a certain spiritual energy which infuses that component that it becomes a functional component and advances it and allows it to address its potential. This, this is the concept. What is a negative commandment? A negative commandment is a diminishment. When you take, ingest, or you cross certain lines, which we call negative commandments, you're actually compromising your soul. You're creating impediments. And the soul doesn't function. I'll give you an example. A person goes, you're supposed to put high-octane gas in the car. And the person goes, instead of putting high-octane, he puts kerosene in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the tank. He starts at the tank. The kerosene runs through the vape, through all the catalytic converters. He destroys. He calls up the manufacturer. He says, I got a warranty. So they said, what happened? He says, well, I, I figured gas is too much. Kerosene is five cents a gallon. I put in kerosene. W warranty void. <laughs> you destroyed everything. You put the wrong type of fuel in it. Kerosene is good for a kerosene lamp, not, not to run the car. You understand? That's a negative commandment. A Jew, based on his soul, if he eats not kosher, it wreaks havoc on his spirituality. If you violate the Shabbos, it wreaks havoc on your spirituality to a greater degree. If you marry the wrong kind of woman, she's not a Jew, God forbid. It totally overtakes the person's life and literally at the brink of, of, a, of destruction. But only God knows. But everyone has a degree of diminishment. And it lessens us. And the 365 areas that if we engage in any one of them, cross those lines, it brings diminishment. I'll give you an example. You have a fire. And you have in the fire, it's an inferno. You have the hope diamond. I always like to use the hope diamond. And the person sees the diamond and knows what it's worth. But he puts his hand in that fire, his hand will be incinerated. Turn to ash, he'll never pull his hand out of that fire. But if he only sees the hope diamond and he doesn't see the consequence and understanding the ramifications, putting him in that fire, he's going to put him in that fire. What's the end result? He lost his arm. And he has nothing to gain. He lost everything. Due to being a composite physical and spiritual, we don't see the forest from the trees. We do things, cross lines that are detrimental to our spirituality. You think you got the cake. You don't, have, you don't have the cake. You don't have the cake and you're not eating it. Neither. No, there's a story about the Holocaust. The Nazis, Yemach Shema B'Zichram, was so demonic and so calculating and so Machiavellian, there's no word to explain, describe what they were. When the Nazis were losing the war and right before they fled from the concentration camps, what they did was 
and the concentration camps, they weren't only Jews, they had Russians too, who were Gentiles. And the rations, the food they gave them was, was not, was below what a human being could survive, calorie-wise, every-wise. Right before the liberation, before these Nazis, they ran and turned into civilian clothing, they distributed large loaves of bread. Each inmate received three large loaves of bread. And what happened? So this Jew hasn't eaten bread in, I don't know, in months since he's come into the concentration camp, into Auschwitz. And as he has the loaves, these Russians, burly Russians, they pounce on him, they beat him unconscious, and they steal the bread from him. And as he's losing consciousness, he says, after all the suffering, finally, my lucky day has come. I got the bread. And they beat me into unconsciousness. What kind of luck do I have? And he goes, blacks out. He comes to eight hours later. He regains consciousness. He looks around. He says, everybody's dead. They had laced the bread with cyanide and arsenic that the people were leaving, we couldn't kill them all. You know what we can do? We're going to give them all the bread they want, but it's going to be laced with poison, and after they finish digesting it, they're not alive any longer. This person didn't realize when he was beaten to a pulp and he lost the bread, that was his life. God gave him his life. When he felt he was denied, when he was waiting to have this moment, by not partaking, that gave him life. McDonald burger with inflation, you're able to buy for 43 cents with the Coke and with the French fries. Could you turn down such a such a such a deal? And it's cooked in tallow, not some kind of synthetic oil. And they'll even you give you a diet, a diet plan afterwards, and some medication for cholesterol. They'll work it out. And they'll give you a free membership to, for, for nutri for, to go to a nutritionist. Okay? How could you turn it down? It's so attractive. But if you understand the consequence of eating that, ingesting that, you'll run from that like running from the devil. Because the havoc will destroy, bring upon your spiritual system. It's the equivalent of what? Spiritual death. But it's so attractive. Eating that bread was also very attractive. But if you would have known there was poison there, you wouldn't have eaten it. It's identically the same thing. But it's a kosher species. Ponderosa steak caps. It smells like steak, grade A beef. Doesn't make a difference if a rabbi would have beard slaughtered it or it was pummeled to death by, by who knows what, by some guy in the, in the slaughterhouse and then shot. Doesn't make a difference. On the grill, it's the same steak. You couldn't tell the difference. In the physical, there's no difference. But it, there's a spiritual ent essence to that. Was it richly sorted? Not. Not, you're not permitted. Was the blood extracted? Was it deveined? All these laws, this has to do with our spiritual makeup. For the non-Jew, means nothing. For the Jew, because of our spiritual systems, it actually undermines it and causes it to go into decline. But how do, how do you know that, Rabbi? You know how I know? Because God, the creator, who, who created that soul says this is what it has to be maintained. It's like the manufacturer, the car manufacturer. He sets the warranty and what the prerequisites to that warranty should be in place. Why? I think I could do with other things. I think I should still be worthy of warranty. You can say what you want. The manufacturer dictates. God is the creator. He dictates. You want to have relevance to the world to come? You have to maintain the soul where God said it has to be maintained. Otherwise, you have, you have no relevance to there. It's called Gateways. It was founded by somebody, Rabbi Sushad, Mati Sushad. He's from originally from Johannesburg, studied in Israel, lives here in the States. And I was very involved in Gateways when it first started. And he would have these uh, outreach seminars for weekends. And to invite people that weren't observant, had very weak background, and they would have first-class lecturers. Lecture, you know, people had doctorates in various areas of their expertise, and they would speak, whether it was psychologists, whether it was historians, whatever you were, to get backgrounds. So there was a rabbi who used to lecture. His name was Rabbi David Ordman. He originally came from England. 
had lived in Israel for many years, and he was a lecturer, a phenomenal lecturer. Spoke with his, you know, British accent, and was smart. He was witty, and he brought out something very interesting. He spoke about the value of time. What is life? Life is time. And then he spoke about, you know, Mark Spitz, who won the swimming Olympics. He got the gold medal. When he won the swimming meet, he won by three nanoseconds. You hear that? What was the value of those three nanoseconds? First, he got the gold medal. Then all of a sudden, Procter & Gamble, they offer him a contract, a million dollars a year to advertise their product. But he has to smile. You got it? So the three nanoseconds, what was its value? Could you imagine? Millions, of, then this other corporation wants him to hawk their, their, their product. That's it. So what's the value of time? In the physical world, what's the value of time? That's one. Person comes, two people, they meet two friends. He says, you know, I think we, ha we, can, we have half an hour to kill till the next flight. What, what term do you use when you, when you waste time? You're killing time. What is life? Life is time. So if you take time and you squander it and waste it, people use the term. I think we can afford to kill the time. We could kill an hour. That, that's the point he made. So if you, that hour has infinite value that if you invest it properly, the Chavetz Chaim makes a calculation. For every word of Torah you study, it's a positive commandment. Every word is the equivalent of 613 mitzvos. So if you make a calculation an hour, you could study 10,000 words. It's 10,000 times 613 on a level which in this existence, it doesn't have the capacity to address one of them. So what's the value of Torah study in that hour? It's the word humongous. I mean, it's, it's not, to, it's no word that you could ex explain what that is. You have people, they go beyond the speed limit. Speed limit is what, is 65? They go 90. Because they want to get where they're going. They arrive, what do they do? Sit around and waste time. I mean, you put your life in jeopardy and other people. You may have gotten a speeding ticket with points in your license. And your insurance goes up. And yeah, if even if you hire a lawyer, of course you have for the lawyer. And after everything you arrive, what are you doing? Because you want to make a minion, you want to make Tfila Bitsibor. Is that the reason why you're, you're rushing to get there? Or you want to see your son off when, before he goes on that flight? Where are you rushing? That's what people are. We rush. We want to have more time. More time for what? I'll give you an example. I remember I went to the... Uh, World's Fair in 1964. It was in New York. It was in Queens. And they had all kinds of like booths there. Westinghouse, General Electric. And they showed what was in the early part of the 20th century. And due to new appliances, at one time for a woman to maintain a, maintain a household, she had to invest about 65 hours a week. You had a scrub board. You had a, a stick, you would beat the carpet, you have to take it out, air it out, wash the floors. Every, it was unbelievable. It was minimally 65 hours a week, just manual labor to maintain a household. Today, with modern appliances, the washing machine, the this, the that, it's, it's eight hours a week, maybe less. The gas range, the oven, the this, the that, okay? People work their whole lives. So they should, could retire at 65. When they retired at 65. And they've already traveled around the world. What did they do with themselves? Well, they used to have a thing called the Gold Age Club. Larry, remember the Gold Age Club? That's what they used to have the diners, a credit card. Diners, you know, those years. So you join an old age, old age not, what would you sit there? You'd sit with a lot of people which had maybe a fraction of your IQ, and you sit and play cards. And they bring you a beer, they bring you a whiskey, they bring you a soda. And at the end of the day, you're depressed. All my life I worked for what? To be a bump on the log. Does it make sense? 
So whole life, you worked like an animal. You were on that, like the mouse on that, on that treadmill, trying to get that piece of cheese. And what happens? All of a sudden, 65 comes, you put out the pasture. Even your kids don't respect you as they did before because you're no longer a rainmaker. They're just waiting to get the inheritance. They don't consult with you anymore. What, what happened? All of a sudden, he lost his intelligence. He's not senile yet, the father. He understands more than they, but they still, they don't consult. Why? Before they consulted with him. Because you're not really a vibrant, active person any longer. We put you out the pasture. So you tell me, if understanding what, and that is the predicament of all people in that world. So where do you put your eggs in whose basket? That you should be productive and vibrant to the last moment of your life. That's what it's about. But Ezu Chochem Rosa Nolad. Who's the wise man? The person who sees the future, the ramifications. You see beyond what everybody else doesn't see. You know, you have estate planning. You go to an expert, estate planning. So you should be able to live and be supported and this. First, has to have spiritual estate planning. You read it, you become physically limited. Now, how do you live out the rest of your life? To be productive on the most advanced productive level. You go to a, a city, uh, a state planning, you know what that's called? That's the rabbi. The Rambam writes that just as the physical ailments, and you go to a physical doctor, the Rambam was the great physician. You go to the spiritual doctor. You know what a spiritual doctor is? Chazal, the rabbis. The ones who are the experts in, in Talmud, in religion, you go to them, you consult with them. They'll advise you exactly how to deal with all these issues, all the illnesses, all the spiritual Achilles heels that we have, how to, how to address it all. But who thinks? You got to be wise. You have to take everything to, have, to be able to consult with something. Someone. You should always have a teacher. Always. As young as elders, you should always have a teacher. I know it all. No, you don't know it all. There's a time in life you need help. You have to be advised. You should have a good friend that you can discuss things with him because he's in a similar predicament as you are. And he may see things better than you see. Those are two co crucial components in success in a person's life. That's what it's all about. I had a conversation two days ago with someone. He happens to be my trainer. Okay? It's not, you know, you have a, you have a dog or a, he, he's a trainer. This person, he helps me, you know, exercise. He's a religious boy, young boy. He's maybe 27. He's married, has one child. And during the whole training session, we talk in Torah. So I said to him, in this gym, it's private. I said, how much Torah do you think has ever been discussed in this gym? I think I say, I think we're one of the only people who ever discussed Torah in this gym. So he says to me, sometimes his wife advises him. And it's critical of him. And he doesn't like it. I said, let me ask a question. Why did God create a woman? A woman's is a connecto. She's your helpmate. What did she help mate? To what? To cook your dinner and Make breakfast for you and wash the dishes and have kids? Is that what is that the helpmate? The helpmate has to do also with what is your objective in life? Why do you exist? You exist for what? For your spiritual, the spiritual objective. So if, let's say she sees you don't get up for Dominic, or you're not learning the way you should be learning. And she says, Jack, I think you should be learning a little more instead of wasting time at night. Why don't you get yourself a study partner? person takes offense to it. What are you talking about? She was created for that to give you good advice. If your business is failing, you want good advice to put you back on track. So what's your wife telling you? She's telling you what you're supposed to hear. If you don't see it yourself, because she's your wife, she has a right to say it, because that's, that's part of her responsibility to you. To put you on that straight and even, and that straight and even, even track. For this, there's a person's name is Eliezer Shmerel, Shmario, 
and this person had a problem with a detached retina. His retina always was detached, and it could ultimately lead to God forbid blindness. And Rabbi, and this person at that time, you couldn't find a greater deprecator than this guy. He used to come to a class of mine somewhere else. And I said to him, I said, no, there's a rabbi coming. He's a very special rabbi, and he's close to me. He's a Kabbalist, Sephardic rabbi. Come and see him. Get a blessing from him. And this person did not wear tefillin at all. He comes to see him, and he sits down before the rabbi, and I was there because I attended every session because he used to speak in, in Hebrew, and I would translate. And he says to him, uh, do you wear tefillin? He says, no. He says, if the rabbi gets you a pair of tefillin, would you wear them? He says, I think so. He says, I, I want to tell you something. You wear tefillin, I will guarantee for the rest of your life, you'll never again have a detached retina. That's what he said to me. What happened? I bought him the tefillin. I remember what I paid for them in those years. A lot less than they cost today. Kosher pair, first class kosher. Since then, we're going back, Larry, how many years ago? We're going back a lot of years, Rabbi. It's, it's uh, About I, 30 years ago. For sure. Oh, for sure, Rabbi. 30 years ago. He hasn't had a beach head. Not only that, there were times he didn't even have to wear glasses. That's true. Because he wore tefillin. And he wrote about it in the, in the Yad Avram newsletter, his personal experience. Okay, that's another tidbit. I should quickly tell you, Rabbi, I, I put that tefillin on and I walked home seeing things I never saw before. And I got at my I said to my wife, we're gonna go for a ride in the car and, and I'm gonna do it without glasses. That was that happened the day I put filling on in your presence. That's the truth. It was a it's a miracle. It is it, the truth. Okay. Baruch Hashem.